Great. Well, we are going to start a new series this morning that we're going to do right up till Easter. It's a multi-campus series. Um, January's series was called As For Me from Joshua 24 verse 15, where Joshua stood in front of the people and said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And uh, we did that series. And that was all about really bringing us back in the new year to a commitment to God. Once you've made the commitment to God, you've got to do something with that. Becoming a Christian isn't just getting, it, becoming a Christian is just getting saved, getting right with God, and then doing nothing with it. Becoming a Christian is the open door for a journey, a process called discipleship. And uh, our next series title for the next seven weeks is creatively called Discipleship or Disciple. Notice we have put an L play right in the middle because a disciple is a learner. A disciple is somebody, and I'll read the different uh, dictionary definition of it. It says, someone who follows the teachings and lifestyle of another who they consider to be superior to them. Well, I hope in the context of us being Christians that we have decided if we have become a Christian and we want to be a disciple, then we go on a pathway of discipleship where everything that we are and everything that we do is fashioned by who we want to follow. So we have bringing our lives into line not just with culture not just with what the church thinks not with what's trendy but bringing our whole lives into line with what Jesus says and what Jesus does so if we are going to look at this whole series on discipleship and my subject this morning I'm going to talk about the call of discipleship next week we're going to do the cost of discipleship and then we're going to do lots of things around that so my topic this morning is the call of discipleship I've got two readings for you first reading we're going to change these around slightly Noah is Matthew 4 reading from verse 18 to 20 and I guess this is the core hanger verse of these next seven weeks it says this as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee he saw two brothers Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew and they were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen come follow me Jesus said and I will send you out to fish for people. One version says, I will make you fishers of men. The Bible says in verse 20, at once they left their nets and followed him. Then jump in a few chapters later, we're going to read from Matthew 16, verse 24 and 25. So this is what Jesus is now saying to the people he said, follow me to, and they are followed who he calls disciples. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. So this is the introduction to this whole series on the call of discipleship. One day Jesus, just after he's probably around the age of 30, as he started his public ministry, walks past two fishermen. They were mending their nets. So they were by the, 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 the sea. They were fishermen. They were just ordinary people. They weren't schooled. They weren't theologians. They weren't members of the Sanhedrin. They weren't big shots. And Jesus said two words that could summarize the whole New Testament in these two words. These two words have caused so much trouble in people's lives. These two words have changed so many people and those two words that Jesus said to them was follow me, follow me. And then in verse 20, the Bible says immediately they put down their nets and followed him. So in looking at this whole topic, of following Jesus in being a disciple, it only is he, it only works if you're at a place in your life where you're saying, I have become a Christian. In other words, I have asked God to forgive me for all my sin. I have come into a relationship with him. And now out of that relationship, I want to follow him because I want to become like him, not ask him to become more like me. And much of the modern church is asking God to become like them. 
I want a God that's like me. I want a God that lets me do what I want to do. I want a God that will put up with anything that I want to do. But a disciple of Jesus is this, somebody who says, follow me, and we say, I'm in. Yes, I am going to follow you. <laughs> Maybe just introduction, let me make a few comments about this before we get to the main points. Jesus did not negotiate with them. I can remember a few years ago, I sold a, an old banger we had. I think it was Georgina's car. And uh, it, I, I couldn't sell it to anybody I liked because it was falling to bits. So I rang a scrapyard and I said, look, I've got a car on the drive. I want 400 pound for it. If you want to give me 400 pound, come round. If you don't, don't bother. So I'm sat watching, I think it was a Saturday, I'm watching a bit of sport, knock on the door and these two likely lads arrive from Scrapyard. And uh, one were walking around the car, kicking the wheels and the other, he says, I'll give you 300 for it. I said, I'm sure you would. He said, no. I said, I want 400. He said, most, uh, mo most we can do, John, isn't it? 320. I said, I want 400. He said, well, 3.20 is most I can do. I said, okay, see you. Shut the door, went back watching sport. A couple of minutes later, I've had a word with me, mate. We can do 3.50. I said, well, well done. But I want 400. He said, he said, are you not prepared to negotiate? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, I've got what you want. And it's 400 pounds. And until you come to £400, that car is mine and it's staying on the drive. Well, we can't pay. If you're not prepared to negotiate, we're not interested. I said, OK, see ya. Shut the door. Two minutes later. I've just found another 20 in my car. <laughs> we'll give you 380 I'm said, I'm sure you would. I said, but the cost 400 He said, you're a hard man to deal with you. I said, yeah, I'm a church leader. I'm used to dealing with difficult people. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, the um denard, um denard. Would you take 390? It'd become personal for this lad now. It was like, it was like I'm going to get him to, he'd have gone to 39999. He would have, I'm sure. I said, it's 400 pound or you can jog on. I said it nice because I'm a Christian. And, so he then, I'd looked at his mate, his mate, not, so he opened his wallet and he gave me 400 pounds. I said, thank you very much, and I closed the door. Now that, that's not a negotiation. That's, this is the cost. And if you want what's on the drive, that's the cost. When Jesus came up to these two likely lads who were fishermen, he, he didn't negotiate with them. He didn't say, lads, follow me, and I'll get you a company car. I'll get you a gym membership. Uh, you get every other weekend off. Uh, no, no, Jesus just said, follow me. And you know what? In serving Jesus, it's not a negotiation. You, you sometimes think we do, but there's no negotiation in serving Jesus. It's you give everything for what he has bought for you. So he laid down his life to give you life. John 10, verse 10 says, life in all its abundance. And as we just said, how do you find that life in all its abundance? By giving your life away. Jesus said, if you want to find life, you've got to lose it. In fact, this is the absolute countercultural message of the Christian life. If you want life in abundance, you've got to give up your own. You've got to, you've got to capitulate. And you've got to come to that point where, Jesus, I will follow you, not for what you can do for me, not because I think my life will be a little bit happier, but Jesus, I will follow you for who you are. Jesus did not negotiate. It's like having kids, I suppose, is it, negotiation? When they're little, I'd say to my kids, do this, and they'd say, why? I'd say, because I've told you to. And then they get to like second year and like secondary school and it work, ain't working like that, is it anymore? You just, it, you have to learn the art of negotiation as a parent. Well, you'll do this and then I'll do that. And if you tidy your bedroom, then you can do this. Or if you 
Go to bed early, you can do that. Everything seems to be in life a negotiation when it comes to our relationship. Let me tell you one relationship in your world that will never be a negotiation, and it's your relationship with Jesus. Now, there's good and bad in that in the sense of unless you're totally in love with him, you'll not pay that price. You'll always think, where's the shortcut? Where's the deal? How can I get out of this without giving everything? But Jesus demands everything. Follow me. It's also interesting when Jesus said, follow me, he didn't give them clarity. Because I'd have been saying, if somebody, well, when are we back? How much does it cost? What can I tell my mum? Because if I'm going to follow you, Jesus, I, I, need some, I need some terms and conditions. But Jesus didn't say, follow me and, 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 and I'll stop. He just said, follow me. The impression is that many times he went up to people, said, follow me, and then walked off. And you'd be like, whoa, whoa, hold on. Let's discuss this. What do you mean, follow me? What, what do you mean, no? I mean, right now. I mean, I've got nets to repair. I've got a family. I've got, I've got a casserole on at home. What do you mean, right now, follow you? You know, one of the massive human needs is certainty. We want to know. Let me tell you about following Jesus. You've got to work on the subject of trust, not knowledge, in the sense of there'll be lots of things, you've just got to follow him, and you don't know. Where are we going? I don't know. How are we getting there? I'm not quite sure. All I know is I am on my way. I'm sure I've read that in the Bible somewhere. So we've got to set off on a journey of following Jesus where there's little clarity. And you know what? I'm glad God doesn't tell us what's coming. Are you? Would you like to know that next week uh, a loved one's going to die, or next week this is going to happen, or next week? I wouldn't. I'm thinking, God, I'm happy that your grace works every day, and I'll just put one foot in front of the other. I, I don't want I don't want to know what's coming. Why? Because if we knew what was coming, we'd probably get back under duvet, put it over our head. But, but God wants us to live and thrive and grow and breathe and have life and have life in all its fullness. So Jesus did not give them clarity. Jesus did not give them time to settle their affairs. At verse 20, I said, he said, at once, at once they followed him. Let me read something to you from Matthew 8. It says this, when Jesus saw the crowd, he gave them orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple came to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. I mean, how harsh is this? That Jesus is only saying, uh, the man is only saying to Jesus, before I follow you, let me go and bury my father. No, he wasn't saying, you know, his dad's dead on the slab and they're just a burial in 10 minutes. He was basically saying this, before I follow you, let me put my affairs in order. Let me get me sorted before I follow you. Let me tell you what I've heard thousands of times over the times I've been a Christian leader. I'll follow Jesus, but I'll get sorted first. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You'll never be sorted enough to follow. You've got to follow Jesus when you're not sorted. You've got to follow Jesus in your brokenness. You've got to follow Jesus in your confusion. You've got to follow Jesus in your mess. You've got to follow Jesus in your unbelief sometimes. You've got to follow Jesus in all those things. And so often people say, ah, ah, well, I'll become a Christian, Derek, when I've, got, when I've got my life in order and I'm good enough to come to church. A lady said that to me two weeks ago in the coffee shop. She said, I'll come to church when I'm good enough. I said, have you seen our church? I said, don't be hanging around for that. You'll never be good enough. You're just going to come to a broken community called the body of Christ, which is me and you. So Jesus didn't, doesn't give us time to, to sort it all out. So Jesus says, follow me. And it's now, it's right now, it's right at this moment, that's what it is. Then Jesus used fishes of men because discipleship is unique. When you read the New Testament, you see a lot of the parables, the stories that Jesus tells, the analogies he gives are about fish 
They're about farming because most of the people in that part of the world were either fishermen or farmers. And the reason that Jesus said fishes of men to these two people is because they were fishermen. If, if Jesus had come in 2023 and he's walking past, let me give it, uh, he's walking past the Boat Wanderers Stadium, that other cathedral in Horwich, and there's two Wanderers fans outside the club shop. He would have walked up to him and said, follow me and you'll be a wandering no more. <laughs> oh, I thought that were good, me. <laughs> now, 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 listen, why? Because it's unique to them. And discipleship is unique to you. Now, there's some, there's some standards that never change, but Jesus' discipleship with you will you look unique because you're unique. It'll look a little bit different on all of us because we are all different. And so we can't impose what God did for me on you. Well, this is what it's got to be because this is how God did it for me. No, no, you, you've got to walk with God and I've got to walk with God. God will talk to you different to me. Why? Because you're different to me. And to these men, he used fish. To other men, he, he used different things. Coming to me when I, in 1984 in Ladybridge Community Centre and saying to me, follow me, Derek, and I will make you a fisher of men. I'd have said I don't like fish. <laughs> but, but it's unique. And you think about when you became a Christian, it was unique to your set of circumstances where God asked you in the middle of all your chaos and all the stuff that you were going through to follow him. So let me give you three quick things because we ain't got a lot of time. How Jesus reveals himself to you. So if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, let me tell you about a follower of you. If we're going to be a disciple, a disciple is not a fan club. Lots of Christians, they're just they're part of the fan club. They find out where the gigs are at and they go at the gigs. They like Jesus. You know, they're, they're, they're part of the fan club, but they're not disciples. Because the fan club, you never get asked to do anything you don't want to do. But disciples often get asked to do something that you don't want to do. Jesus has lots of admirers that are not followers. People that would say, even in the context of today, uh, well, he, he was a good man with good teachings and good sentiment. And, you know, he... he, 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 he he wasn't bad he wasn't god but he wasn't bad and we have to be very 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 clear that jesus is not looking to increase the supporters club he's not looking to increase his fan base on the earth he's not even looking for admirers that would compliment him he is looking for people from every nation and every tongue, from every background, from every part of society that meet him in their own unique set of circumstances. And when we hear the words, whether they are the literal words or they're through a preach or they're through an inner feeling or whatever it is, where God says, follow me. And they say, yes, I'm in. So we've got to ask ourselves these questions. Well, how do we, if we're following Jesus, how do we know what Jesus was like? And how do we know how we should be if we are followers of him? So how does God reveal himself to us? Well, Jesus reveals himself, and it should appear on the screen, through his character. So if you want to be like Jesus, you have to look at what his character was like and make sure that your character I'm not talking about, when I talk about character, I'm not talking about funny ha-ha. I'm talking about the characters like integrity, trust, honesty, faithfulness, courage. All these things were part of the character of Jesus. We've got to look at how Jesus expressed those characteristics. How did he treat people? Jesus got in trouble for how he treated women. Because he treated women well. He didn't put them down. He didn't treat them as not as equals. He treated them with dignity and respect in a time that saw women as subservient just to men. Jesus was radical. How he treated the rich and the poor. Jesus never said it was a sin to be rich. 
And neither did he say it was a virtue to be poor. Listen, poor rich. Jesus said, the poor you always have among you. It's not about poor or rich in this world. It's about our character. You may have no control over your bank balance. You may, not, may have no control over your job opportunities. But let me tell you what you have got control over. Who are you following? And how are you allowing that following of Jesus to shape your character? Jesus didn't powtow to rich people. And neither did he dismiss poor people. He treated every man, woman with dignity and respect. How did he treat people that were foreigners, refugees, people that, that were not resident of where he was? He treated them well with respect. There is so much, there is so much of Jesus' character that we need in Christian character today. Remember years ago, you had them um, wristbands that said, WWG, what would Jesus do? And I know they were a bit twee and a bit cheesy and everything, but let me tell you this, that should be more than a wristband. It should be tattooed on your heart. What would Jesus do? And then ask yourself the question, if that's what Jesus would do, that's what I should do. Have you ever been at work where there's been gossip or inappropriate joking or stuff that you really know you shouldn't be talking about? And you feel that thing inside you that you know, that this is where Jesus would say, I'm out. I'm walking away from this. And you know that tension of trying to fit in and yet trying to be different. Trying to fit in and trying to be different. Because we don't want to feel like we, we, we don't fit in. We want to be everybody's friend. We want to be invited to everybody's barbecue and go to everybody's birthday and be everybody's chum. Let me tell you, if you're going to follow Jesus, it will put you at enmity with some people. Some people will hate you. Because you follow Jesus. And Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, like, he just doesn't make it easy. He said, don't worry if they hate you. They hated me first. So listen, if they hate you because you follow Jesus and everything, suck it up. It's par for the course. Don't worry. It's probably because as more, as more and more of Jesus is seen in you, it almost, it almost irritates people. Why are you like that? Because I want you to be like me. Because if you're like me, then I may feel better about me. But you forgive people, and I don't want to forgive people. You're kind to people, and I don't want to be kind to people. You don't tread on people, and I want to tread on people because I want to get to where I want to get to. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you have to realize that Jesus has revealed himself through his character. And as you read the Bible, don't read it as a story. Read it as character development for yourself. Number two, and it's nuanced from number one jesus reveals himself through words and actions what did jesus do i told you a few weeks ago about that sixth form conference i did at canon slade where that guy stood up and said mr smith i want you to know i don't believe a word that jesus said and i asked him to stand up again and say tell us all the things that jesus said that you don't believe and he couldn't because he was an idiot and you know, there are, there, I'm not calling everybody in life, but, but some people have rejected Jesus and don't know what he said. So what did Jesus say? What were his attitudes, his priorities, his habits, his behavior? Jesus withdrew to a quiet place. Well, that's a great habit, isn't it? To withdraw to a quiet place. That we, you know, we would call that a quiet time. I'm not sure how biblical a quiet time is, but withdrawing to have time alone with God is a very biblical thing. Jesus had priorities and his attitudes. How Jesus thought, what he said, when he withdrew, when he said something and when he said nothing. So Jesus reveals himself through his words and his actions. So when we preach on a Sunday and we talk about Jesus or we talk about um, different things in Scripture, it helps us build a picture of how we should behave. It's not about control. It's not about coming under the church. 
It's about if you choose to come unto Jesus. This is totally voluntary surrender. You're not here with your arm up your back. It's voluntary surrender because you said, when Jesus walked past your life and said, follow me, you said, yeah. What the church's job is, is to help you understand what that looks like in everyday life. Follow me. Thirdly, and finally, we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Jesus reveals himself through his written word. Now we know, right, a bit of, bit of theology, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus came and lived, part of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus took on the form of flesh and came to live amongst us for approximately 33 years, to live a life we couldn't live, to die a death we couldn't die, in order to bring us right with God. But well, I don't want you to think, and some Christians get locked, that somehow Jesus is on the earth and God's out there doing the, and they're not connected. Let me tell you that Jesus wrote the Old Testament. He was there at the beginning. Because he's God. So in Genesis chapter 1, where the waters, uh, you know, where, where God is hovering above the waters, you know who it was? It was Jesus. You know who revealed himself to Abraham? Jesus. So, so Jesus is not a New Testament phenomenon. And some Christians like to keep Jesus in the New Testament and divorce him from all the bad things. In the old, that Jesus is really nice. And the Old Testament God is really horrible. Old Testament God is like a school teacher and Jesus is like your grandma. Get away with murder. No, Jesus is the part of the Godhead. And so Jesus therefore wrote the Bible. Now, many scholars in our world today want to say, well, you know, what Jesus said and what the Apostle Paul said, they're two different things. Jesus may not have agreed what the Apostle Paul said. Well, if you believe that the Bible was put together by the hand of God through the hand of men, then you have to acknowledge that Jesus wrote the Bible. Jesus penned through humanity the Bible. So Jesus is not doing stuff that contradicts the word of God. So if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to follow what the Bible says because he wrote it. What does the Bible say about money? Well, Jesus wrote that. Give to God what God and give to Caesar what Caesar's. Follow me. So Jesus says, follow me and I'll show you what to do with your money. How many Christians want to, want to follow God, but tip him? Too many Christians are tippers, not tithers. They tip God for good service. And if they have a sulk for six weeks because it didn't work, what they thought, I don't know, they, they sulk with God and withhold their giving. Let me tell you, you're not giving to church, you're giving to God. So what does the word say about, what does the word say about gender and human sexuality? Not what does the culture say, because culture will change. What's in today and what's acceptable today will be different to tomorrow. So we've got to look at what did Jesus say? Because if we're following him, it's not about the subjectivity of how do I feel. I've got to bring everything I am into line with what he says, or I'm not a true follower. I'm just part of the fan club who says, Jesus, we love you, but don't make demands on me. Jesus, I love you, but don't ask me what I do with my money. Don't ask me who I get in bed with. Don't, don't ask any of that, Jesus. That's my business. I'll, I'll be part of the fan club, but I don't want to be a disciple. Why? Because the cost of discipleship is too great. What does the Bible say about forgiveness? What did Jesus say about forgiveness? Well, he gave us a good example, didn't he, on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So if you're a follower of Jesus and you have unforgiveness in your heart and you have not repented of that, you're not a follower of Jesus. You're a follower of your own feelings. Follow me. As I've prepped this this week, I've just been overwhelmed. 
not in a service like this, but in my own office upstairs, with how countercultural Jesus is. What a revolutionary he is. How he would never fit in today. And he's still saying 2,000 years later, as he walks past people's lives, business people, unemployed people, rich people, poor people, gay people, straight people, whatever. And he says this, follow me. Well, I'll follow you. As, no, 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 no. You don't get to negotiate this. Follow me. I'll finish with the story because I want to pray. A few years ago, I had some counselling. Um, not for any bad, gross sin, just just for health and well-being. And it's the buzzword, isn't it? And I had some. And um, my counsellor, who I said, I'll have counselling, but I want to drive 100 miles from Bolton because I don't want anybody knowing me. Because, you know, I, I'm, I didn't want to sit down and say, oh, are you, Derek? We've been to Kings. Uh, so I'll have counselling, but I want to drive. So anyway, I'm, I sorted this counsellor out with this lovely lady who counsels um, doctors and police officers who have gone through trauma. So doctors whose patients have died during the operation and police officers that have visited crime scenes and pastors, which <laughs> I don't know why. So I sat down, really, really uncomfortable because I'm a Bolton lad, right? We don't do feelings, do we? And we just don't. I'm like, I'm really uncomfortable. And I'm sat in this conservatory, really uncomfortable. And she said this to me. She said, Derek, tell me everything you can remember between being born to being five. I went, oh, here we go. It's how I was potty trained. It's, oh, if we're going to, oh, no. And, and, and like, she said, tell me everything you remember. I said, I can't remember anything really, not to five. She said, you can, you've just stored it. She said, I'm going to help you remember. It's 20 minutes later, I've remembered loads of stuff that she's unpicking stuff out of me. And she said, tell me, tell me some of the things you remember. Because I haven't got a brilliant memory, but I remember. This is the one thing that I want to land this service with of what I remember. I remember being 11 and being absolutely distraught when all my mates passed their 11 plus and went to Dean Grammar. And I didn't and went to Dean High. And all my mates like kind of going to one school and me going to Dean High being distraught. And I remember going as a first year, year seven, they call it now, but we were first years in them days. I'm going to Dean absolutely petrified because my brother, who's five years older than me, had told me all the stories. They flush your head down the toilet day one. They, 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 uh, they reenact the crucifixion on the school gates. And I, so I'm absolutely petrified. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to get, because I wasn't, I wasn't very tall. I was a bit snappy, but I wasn't very tall. And um, I can remember, and I don't know why I can remember this, because I can't remember any other lesson. I remember my first humanities lesson with Mr. Ashurst. Mr. Ashurst, the world feared him. He was an older gentleman, bald head. He dressed immaculately. And I can always remember he used to come and stand outside his office on the main corridor. I can picture it now. And I remember, all I remember, Mr. Ashurst, he always had really polished, shiny shoes. And he used to rock like this. And he used to have the voice that I thought, that must be the devil. <laughs> Smith! walk in my school and everybody was absolutely petrified of him and then we got our timetable humanities mr ashes i think oh lord so i'm thinking right i'm going to sit near the bike so we went into the humanities humanities i don't know if they do it anymore it's like a bit of history a bit of geography and a bit of a few other bits mixed in and I sat right at the back, Mr. Ashes lesson, thinking, I'll keep my head down, I'm only small, I'll hide. And why can I remember this and nothing else about most of my secondary? I can't remember one other lesson. He walked in and I was 11 years old and he said this. Get your stuff out, we've got our books out. And we also had a shelf full of good news Bibles. He said, pass the Bibles round. So we had all these good news, but I remember really thick Bibles, yellow they were. And he said this, anybody in here believe in this nonsense? No, I didn't then. 
Nobody put their hand up. And then this is what he said. He said this. Great, now we've got that codswallop out the way. Now we can get on and learn. So he put, make, let's collect all the Bibles again, put them back in the book cabinet. And then we started learning about this, that and the other. I wonder why he remembered that. And I can't remember my secondary education. 30 years later, I'm the senior pastoral officer at Hyper Green School and I'm in the staff canteen one day and uh, I was talking to a few teachers and a girl sat opposite me. I'd guess 30, but I'm lousy at guessing ages of women and, and I know you can get it wrong and wrath can flow. So I just, I, I always go, you look 14, I don't care. I just, this girl opposite me, and we're all chatting and I said, uh, what's your name? She told me your name. Ah, oh, great, great, great. I said, what school did you go to? She said, I went to this school. She said, what school did you go to? I said, oh, you'll probably not even know. School. I went to Dean High. She said, did you? My granddad was a teacher at Dean High. I said, what was his name? She said, Stanley. I said, no, what was his? Stanley Ashurst. I said, that's your granddad? She said, yeah. I said, is the old beggar alive? She said, yeah, he lives in Spain. I said, do you ever speak to him? She said, yeah, I'm speaking to him tonight. I said, will you pass a message on for me? She said, yeah, what, what? Do you want? She's writing it down. I said, will you tell him that in 1975, he had a little boy in his class who he totally intimidated called Derek Smith. And he asked him a question that did he believe in this nonsense? Can you please tell him from me that I not only believe in that nonsense, but I've given my life to that nonsense. And that nonsense has changed my life. So a week later, I promise I'll close with this because time is gone. I said, did you tell him? She said, yeah. I said, what did he say? She said, you don't want to know. <laughs> it was probably some tongues or speaking in tongues or something like that. It's amazing, isn't it? Follow me. If you're going to follow me, not me, don't follow me. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to have some stuff. We have to walk through some stuff. We have to walk through other people's ridicule that don't know what you know. You're gonna, you're not gonna get applause. You're not gonna get an OBE for following Jesus. But let me tell you this: the most incredible, incredible thing that you can ever do is follow Jesus. And I wish. I could get in a time machine, go back to 1975. And you know what? I wouldn't sit at the back, I'd sit at the front. And when he said, does anybody believe this nonsense? I think I do. That scene from Dead Poet Society, where I stand on my desk and say, captain, my captain. In other words, he's my Lord, he's my God. And he's one of the few good things left in this world. So we're about done. I'm going to pray. Just really pray today for us online across all our campuses as we look at this message. That we will again live in the light of that decision to follow him. That call, that call. And as I pray right now, maybe you've never come to the point in your life where you've You've followed Jesus. You've said yes. You've done like these two disciples did. That They left their nets. You're trying to work it out. Well, I, I want to follow Jesus, but I, I, I need to do this first. No, 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 no. You'll never get there. You'll, it only works when you just do it. So I'm going to pray right now. Close your eyes. Jesus, thank you that 2,000 years ago you stood in front of two men, hardcore fishermen, and you said, follow me. And they left their nets and followed you. 
God, I thank you for the last 2,000 years. The message has been going out to the lost on every continent in the world. Follow me. And we thank you in a church on Berry Road in Bolton in 2023. The message is still going out. Follow me. Just while every head is bowed and every eye is closed. If you're in here this morning and you have never made that choice to say, Jesus, I will follow you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that today. I will follow you. Nobody's looking around, just me. And if you want to do that, I'm going to pray a very quick prayer. You just say amen at the end of this prayer. All our men means is God do it. Father, I come to you today choosing to follow Jesus. Forgive me of all my sin. Come into my life. Change me from the inside out that I can follow you with all of my heart all the days of my life. Amen. Keep your eyes closed, keep your head back. If anybody prayed that for the very first time, would you raise your hand? I'll see it. I just want to say thank you. And then at the end of the service, we've got an, a, a place where you can come and receive some prayer. Is there anybody? Just raise your hand nice and high so I can see it. Thank you. Anybody else? Just give me a little bit more light so I can see. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else saying, Jesus, I want to follow you with all of my heart. Father, thank you for these people. Thank you that 2,000 years later, people are still putting down their nets to follow you. Father, I pray you'll bless our church. Prosper our church in every way. Materially, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. Bless our church. That we may walk as you would want us to walk in the world that we live in. Thank you, God, for grace that covers all our failure. Thank you for grace that covers all our mess. Thank you for grace that is the cement in our relationships, not doctrine or that we all believe the same, but grace and understanding. Thank you, God, as we do this series right up to Easter, as we look at what it means to be a disciple, a follower. Father, you'll do incredible things. And Father, I pray finally this morning for a man in Spain called Stanley Ashurst. God, that I haven't seen since I was 11. God, speak, save, bring revelation to men and women that feel they've got life sussed but are in abject poverty of you because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said Amen